Okay. Well, I see, Bob, you were, I didn't work here last week. So what we're doing is um, looking down both issues uh, around election. Um, the, uh, we have a list here for things God's word has to say about it, about election, uh, whether a uh, person is safe or not, it's God's choice. And we're going to sh finish sharing these today. That's the challenge. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, we'll go next week to all the passages, not all the passages, but uh, as many passages on this side for uh, what scripture has to say about us making the choice. So uh, the mistake many people make is they think they have to be one way or the other. And so um, this here gives enables us fix it uh, equips us with a knowledge of what does God's word say about uh, yeah. God making the choice? Does it really say that? Uh, and what about uh, what does God's word tell us that we make the choice? Does it really say that? And so uh, uh, we we should be able to come up with an answer to the election question if we stick with God's word. Uh, don't stick with um, the opinion of some theologian, which churches have done for uh, all down, you know, through history. And so rather than study uh, Arminianism or studying Calvinism, you're, you're studying the wrong source. Because you're studying what man's understanding has been on this topic. Is there anything wrong with that? Oh, God has given us godly men to help us. Uh, the Holy Spirit, our Holy Spirit's our teacher, and He uses people. He uses uh, writings that people have left behind, and all these kind of things for a benefit. But when we really are in a quandary around something. In my opinion, the only real source to um, uh, uh, enter into and and know for sure is what God Himself has said about it. Because I don't care. It, outside of that, you're going to uh, follow the best debater. Mm -hmm. well, and there's some men out there that can make you think either way. Absolutely. Yeah. And for to say, Tom, if you, if you really studied. Calvinism, if you really studied Arminianism and really dug down into what their work was, yeah. they're going to point to the scriptures. Yes, they are. So then you need to go look at those scriptures from both sides, which is what we're doing, you know. <laughs> well, both I don't scriptures. look at it that way. I don't look at it. I'm looking at, at the teachings of these two men. I'm look, I want to know what? what God says. Right. Yeah, I know they'll all quote scripture. And they point to You scripture. go to the most yeah. liberal church in Spencerport, and they'll be quoting the Bible. Right. Right, so uh, so you go study what they what they. I don't. I don't. Yeah. At this point, I don't like to say it this way. I don't care what man thinks. <laughs> I want to know what God thinks. Mm -hmm. No matter if it, if uh, someone has taken a, a certain position on it, I uh, I have no uh, problem with under listening to them and and hearing what they have to say. But I uh, what I want in my mind. Is what God has said. I don't want to first fill my mind with what man says about God's word. I want to fill my mind with what God has said in his word. And to me, there's a difference. You know, I, I think uh, studying what man thinks about is going at something coming in through the back door uh, so that uh, you can see. Um, to me, it's the difference between apologetics and systematic theology. Uh, I grew up from Bible college on systematic theology. That's where you get God's word and the understanding of it. Um, to uh, go the other route through uh, apologetics is you're getting man's answer to spiritual things and, uh, and you take into consideration their opinions. Where systematic theology, 
you're getting out of God's word what he says about it first. And you get what God has said about it all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Because you can cherry pick all the information you want on any topic and a good debater will be able to, uh, you won't be able to answer them. The, the, the best speaker will win the battle because uh, he can twist it very well and, and effectively. So, and you don't even have to agree on that with me, but I, that's my thinking on it. Uh, any other thoughts on it? That's fine. We're going to, uh, uh, so that's why we're taking scripture. And I've got to say to Jim, some scripture. <laughs> There's some other scriptures, and then we'll, uh, we would make this study you know, year long. Uh, taking everything that God's word says from Genesis to Revelation mm -hmm. along this line and then later along this line. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is uh, get a picture, a snapshot of the, the hilltops in both of these opinions. So uh, that's where we're, we're headed today. So we'll start with prayer. Otherwise, uh, we're not starting in the right place. We need a teacher. And uh, the only one God gave us really that enlightens the heart and gives his understanding is the Holy Spirit. So let's pray and uh, look to him when we get going here. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit. We ask you this morning to... Uh, other to use the Holy Spirit as a uh, the teacher that you have given him to us for uh, in such a way, Lord, that uh, comprehension will be that which you provided. I would pray that um, you will enable us to see what you want us to see. And as a result of it, uh, uh, Lord, have a uh, an understanding that satisfies the heart, the soul, and uh, the way we uh, walk in your presence through each and every day and help us to be able to share what you teach us with others when you give us those kind of opportunities. We pray this morning for those who can't be here with us, um, who are sick and recovering from illnesses and operations. And we have brethren that are just uh, not able to get out this morning. We pray for them and um, may they be aware of your presence also. And uh, may they also sense your um, hand upon uh, the truth of your word as we talk about it. So we commit the time to you. We give you thanks for what you're about to do and uh, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, I prepared a, a preliminary thought that goes with either side up here. And uh, it's a, uh, a baseline thought that uh, ties right into this. I'd like you to turn to Psalm uh, chapter uh, 14, because I'm going to share with you something out of God's word that he has entered into the Old Testament scripture and is even... Uh, brought the same thing and recorded it in the New Testament scripture. So it's in both uh, the old and new. Uh, and so uh, it's obviously something that is important to God or he certainly wouldn't have emphasized it in, in both testaments. And uh, it has to do with man's goodness. Um and man's uh, uprightness, man's uh, character. And so starting in uh, Psalm 14, we're just going to read the, the first uh, three verses. Anybody, uh, any one of you, go ahead and read that out of, uh, I'll, I'll read it out of the New American, but if you have something different, read it out of that. I have, I have ESB. Do that. Then. The fool says in this in his heart there is no God, 
They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Anything kind of earth shaking there? Oh. No. <laughs> he, 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 he could say the same thing today and he yeah. did back then. Yes. Uh, how many people are there that... And I'm making an assumption that the people of that day are just like the people of today. Mm -hmm. And everybody <clears throat> from Adam on down, this applies to. Mm -hmm. So how many do good? None. None. Yeah. No one, he says. No one. What? Man thinks he does good. <laughs> God says none. That's an earth. That's an earth-shaking word. None, or no one. There's not a person ever been born that does good. So you better find out what good means, right? Uh, let me ask you another question. How many? Um, uh, how many understand and comprehend the fullness or uh, the ministry of uh, what the Holy Spirit is? teaching us how many in and of themselves can understand it or do understand it none no. same thing no one nobody does good nobody understands how many people search for god purposely none. no okay in any way you want to <laughs> none in any way you want to put it no one there he, uh, he says uh who seek after anybody who understands who seeks who seek after God? Nobody. That should be that should be mind-boggling. Anybody that reads this and and understands what he's saying here. Nobody does good, nobody understands, nobody looks for God, nobody seeks God. Nobody uh, seek a God. <laughs> well, that yeah, nobody seek after God. Not this God. I don't even think they seek the idols. I think they just try to placate the idols. I don't know if that's seeking or makes themselves seeking feel is someone really searching for the true and the living God. Mm -hmm. How many? Yeah, nobody. None. Uh, let's see, is there another one? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, he says here they have all rebelled. That's the way I would. Put it in my own language. They've all turned aside. They've all gone in the wrong direction. How many of them? I circle it. All. Not most. Not some. Not a few. He says every one of them, all of mankind, has uh, turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. No wonder our government's corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's made up of corrupt men. Because mm -hmm. all men are, all men, he says here, have turned away from God, and all men are corrupt, therefore. And he finishes by saying, There is no one. Mm -hmm. he, you think he's repeating, but I think he's recapping it here. He says, No one, not one, no one does good, not even one. What chance, I'm asking you, what chance does man have? Not. <laughs> All right, it's, let's it's, go ama to... it's amazing how he, he um, before the flood, yes. he said there's only one who does it. <laughs> would, 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 he didn't say that about. He said that Noah was, was, was righteous, righteous yeah. in his sight. Yeah. Right. And I'm assuming... And this is my assumption that Noah was a rascal. Yeah. Uh, that God did a work in him because I don't think Noah was left out of this. He's probably he was probably chosen just like Abraham was, just just picked out and then tested. Yeah. Well, he says no one, mm -hmm. and that would include mm -hmm. everybody all the way back to Adam. No one uh, does that. Yeah, and we can we can. Uh, we, we can't 
we can't violate that that truth. Uh, now I want to just take you over to Romans chapter three. I think we're going to see the same thing, but this time it's being quoted by it's by Paul, uh, and it's in the New Testament. Not in the old, but now in the new. In Romans chapter 3, we'll look at verses 10, 11, and 12. Meryl, <clears throat> uh, you want to read 10, 11, and 12? <clears throat> and by the way, this is um, uh, uh, Paul speaking. <laughs> and um, uh, he's saying God's condemnation He's, uh, he's in an explanation of why right. God's condemnation is just and, and holy and so on. Right. So look what he quotes. Go ahead and read those three verses. As it is written. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have to, together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And he goes on to explain more. <laughs> I like that. It goes right along with, well, we got the same thing being told to us uh, in the Old Testament, now in the New yeah. Testament. Yeah. Um, Isaiah 53, you may know it from memory. All we like sheep. All, all, all. We. All we. Like sheep have gone astray. We've gone astray. We have turned uh, our uh, into our own way. In other words, we we're going. God's going that way. We're going that way. We're rebelling. We're going the opposite from God. We turn and uh, see how's that verse end up. Uh, everyone has turned their own way. I can't remember the last phrase, but it's basically just telling us, yes, uh, it, that's another spot from God's word where he tells us that all of us have turned our own way and um, and uh, strayed. Add that to what we already know have been told here about mankind. And... Um, and then I would like you to go to John chapter 6. Before reading John chapter 6, uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses. But The, the uh, ending of that one. Yeah. It says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of yeah. us all. Thank you. Talking about Christ. Yeah, I just couldn't. Yeah. It the most. Yeah. And, and in both of those cases, I would circle that word all. Mm -hmm. Not some, not most. Oh. He's laid it on uh he's laid it on the son all uh, of our iniquity, all of our sin. That's all quite, of it. That's a burden. That's a, that's a huge burden. <laughs> yeah. And there's none of us who are those four things. Mm -hmm. If we just if the Lord just gave us an awareness of what that really looks like. From a divine point of view, and handle it. Yeah, we'd be done for today. Mm. Mankind. I've heard somebody. I don't know who said it, but I've I've heard it said many times that uh, God, um, uh, now the thought left my mind. Maybe you didn't want me to share it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that. Um, I'm going to skip the thought and come back to this one. When that returns, if it does, I'll share it with you. Um, I want to, uh, we, we just read enough from God's word to realize that uh, we're ruined. We, mm -hmm. If it depends on mankind, how many are going to choose God? None. Based on what we've just been reading. Nobody's going to choose God. Left to his own devices, man is opposite from God. And, and the point I'm stressing in my own mind is mankind is uh, never in his own being 
going to choose God. No one. According to God's word. The world's full of people who are running away from God. You and I were running away from God. But now we're with God. And, and I'm not going to deal with the question of how that happened. Oh, well, we need to start with one thought. We live in a world of people who would never choose God. And it applies to everybody. In other words, we're all lost. We're born with the uh, we're born with uh, the sentence of death already owned by us. That's mankind, period. Every one of them. From those we consider good to those we consider bad. According to God's word, nobody's good. Nobody searches God. Then what is what is going on? Why are some people coming to him? Isn't that the, isn't that the question we're trying to answer? Uh -huh. So I wanted to, we're starting to look at some more scripture uh, concerning God's making the choice, but we had to see here that man would have never made the choice. Uh, according to scripture. So yeah, I think up to Isaiah when he he realized that and the coals, remember the coals was put yeah, on. Yeah. You know, it's and it's hard to conceive. It is. It's hard to conceive. it is. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to see some things uh, particularly clearly yes. to make a right a uh, some uh, a right uh, uh, uh Application of the right truth being understood. Correct. Uh, so uh, we're at John chapter 6 right now. And I'm just going to look at verse uh, uh, verses 37 and uh, 39. 637. Why am I in Romans? <laughs> behind myself. Okay. John 6. Hmm? Okay, 637. Um, and this is Jesus speaking himself, right. right? He says, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Um, I'm just going to read 38, but just in order to get to 39. In 38, for I have come down from heaven, Jesus was telling them, not to do my own will. I came down from heaven to do the will of him who sent me. So it's saying here, the Father, in verse 37, is... By whatever means he has done it, he ha is giving some of mankind to uh, uh, work in, so that they they will come to come to the Lord, come to Jesus. This is what he says: uh, "All the Father gives me." So the Father is giving him uh, certain people, and he says, "All that the Father gives me." Uh, so if God the Father gives an individual to Jesus, uh, it's going to be all of them, not some of them. Everyone that the Father uh, is giving, he's giving to the Son, and he's given them all that, uh, I'm going to put my thoughts in here, he's given them all he wants him to have, which isn't all of them. They're all running the other way. He's taken out of all the rebels a certain group, and he's given that certain group to Jesus, his son. And Jesus is saying every one of them, all of them, every single one of them that the father gives to the son will come to him. And that's what Christ came here for. In verse 39, he says, And this, this is the will of him who sent me. 
In other words, this is the will of the Father. This is not the will of the Son. This is the will of the Father, who has given him uh, certain ones we know. I'm going to use the word chosen ahead of myself. But he gave them, uh, and this is the will of him who sent me, that of every single one, he used the word all, that of all that he has given me, how many has he lost? None. Um, Not one. Not one. He's lost every single one that the Father gives a son will come to him. Not a certain amount out of it, <laughs> but every single one that the Father gave to the son, those that the Father gave him, they will come to him. And it says, and he's going to raise it up on the last day. I mean, what I'm oh. saying here is pretty plain. Shouldn't even really take any explanation. God the Father gave those he wanted to, to his son. And every one of them that he gave him will, I'm going to use the word approach, will come to Christ. Come to me. Will come to me. So something's got to transpire that would take a rebel running that way to turn around and come to him. He's not telling us what that is yet, but he's telling us that's what happened out of all of mankind who every one of them are enemies of God and run the other way. Every one of them. He takes some of these rebels, you know, picture, picks them up in a group, gives them to the sun. And whatever that he accomplishes in them when he does this, giving them to the sun, they end up they end up approaching Christ. They end up coming to him. Think I'm overstating this? Mm -hmm. Is that what he's saying here? Mm -hmm. This is the will of him who sent me. Here's what, in other words, this is what the Father is doing. And it includes all in this group that he has given to the Son. He says that of all that he has given me, I know I don't lose a single one of them. <laughs> Every one of them are going to come. It's not iffy. Right. When it's we go out it. there to serve the Lord and we're giving them the gospel, we don't know whether they're one of the chosen or not. But if they're one of the chosen, they're going to come to Christ. Maybe not at your hand, but it, maybe you're someone God is using to prepare them. But at some point, they're going to come. They're going to come looking for the Lord. I find that a very encouraging thing. Thing is, he didn't put a he didn't put a silver stripe down the back of everybody who's one of the chosen. So I don't know who I'm talking to. Might be a chosen person. Might not be a chosen person. My job isn't to choose them. My job isn't to save them. My job is just to tell them the truth, to tell them the gospel. And he does the rest. He already knows who he's chosen. I don't. And God didn't tell me to go to the chosen. God told me to go to the world. Tell the world. And out of that, he'll do his work. Yeah. Conceiving that puts evangelism on a unique basis to me. Uh, a lot of people would just worry about I haven't saved anybody in, <laughs> you know, last year. Well, my question is, how many people did you tell the gospel to? How many people did God give you an opportunity to share the way with? That's the real question to be answered, is that one. Because you're not going to save anybody. They're all going that way. God will do something, you give them the word, and God does a work that changes their direction from that way to coming to Christ. And he's not going to lose a single one. That's too big for me to really fully grasp, but I can see it in God's word. So uh, Jesus, uh, the Father selected some, and he gave them to Jesus, so 
Uh, and then in verse 39 there, Jesus takes every single one and loses none. All right, now let's, that was kind of, that was only meant to be a five-minute intro. Uh, <laughs> because now we're going to go to Romans chapter 8, where we were when we, uh, well, actually, we were, yeah, we were in Romans 9. So let's turn to 9 just to recap uh, for uh, just a minute. Uh, we're in... Uh, I'm starting to timer time. <laughs> uh, I, and the point that we were studying in here uh, was that election, the election glorifies God's grace. It reveals God's kindnesses and purpose. Election is suitable for the, the plan and purposes, the management of God's plans. Election predestines God's will and purpose. Elections secure uh, the praise of God's glory. Election provides a ceiling, that is a protection, a guarantee, uh, and that's the person of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 14, election provides uh, the Holy Spirit as a pledge. In other words, as a down payment. He's the guarantee we have of an inheritance. And, um, and, uh, and then in verses 11 and in verse 14, we read about how God's choosing uh, is dependent upon his purpose and his will. And um, we can see that when he chose Jacob over Esau, Esau because Esau was the oldest. He was the one who sure, sure, that's he should have been the, uh, the inheritor. And God chose uh, Jacob, and good God didn't ask for permission. <laughs> he just did it. He didn't explain nothing. He didn't explain nothing. <laughs> and in verse 14, we get the point that at times, mankind doesn't understand uh, how God uh, many times works. And here in verse 14, the apostles were in Jerusalem. They heard that Samaritans... Now we're getting saved. <gasps> the whore. And they received the word of God. <laughs> so the, the Jews got all upset. So they sent Peter over there and John to deal with it. Because they didn't understand, what's God doing? Uh -huh. Well, God didn't tell them. Uh, it's uh, mankind doesn't understand election. And uh, I can say amen to that. Uh -huh. I'm trying to learn more and be more accurate, but... Uh, it's beyond me, but uh, God didn't uh, explain it to me the way that uh, my human humanity uh, likes to deal with things. And uh, he's not obligated to explain omniscience to the onlookers, like in, in our diagram up here, where man can understand this to this level. But election <laughs> includes a lot of information that omniscience knows. But not limited, not limited understanding. God doesn't is not obligated to tell man what's up here. What's that passage in scripture says the secret things belong to God. God in Deuteronomy. But the things that God has given to us is our responsibility. When we spend our time trying to figure out what's up here, um, we are missing what God has given to us to understand at what level. So uh, that uh, gives us the awareness that, well, you know, God is working in ways I don't understand, uh, but if I read what he has given to me, I can understand it to the level he wants me to understand it. Mm -hmm. That's key. Because don't we, don't a lot of, of us believers, professors who know Christ, don't a lot of times we spend our time looking up things that he hasn't revealed, trying to put a reason to it that we can understand when God hasn't revealed anything on it? God hasn't given those things to us. Don't waste your time. Spend your time learning what he has given to us. And uh, the things that uh, 
uh, are above that and beyond that, God will reveal whenever he wants to. So uh, here we're getting out of uh, um, the, the thought here that, that election depends on God's plans and purposes, not man's comprehension. And uh, that is that, why did God choose Israel instead of some other name? I don't know. In fact, he makes a point out of that in one passage. He says, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest in number. In fact, you're the weakest. God had a reason for choosing them. And uh, now we should read God's word to see if he reveals the why somewhere. But if he doesn't, I'm not going to waste my time trying to make up some just because I'll understand it and I can justify it in my own mind. Uh, so uh, the only point I want to make here out of this series in Romans 9, pretty much the whole chapter, is that uh, God's in control of election. And there are going to be things in there I don't understand. And uh, uh, those I need to leave in his hands and go with what he has shown us. Um, I would like to stop here, take a rabbit trail, but I'm not going to. <laughs> because uh, um, I would like to take about 10 minutes uh, sometime to go over the difference between signs, miracles, and wonders. There's all three of these supernatural uh, works in the Bible, in the New Testament, and none of them share the same, so they're all different words. A sign, no, I'm not going to go anymore, but we, uh, uh, we'll, we'll spend a little time sometime distinguishing what the difference is. Some people mix them up and think one's the same as the other. It's not. Completely different. Signs, signs, um, uh, miracles, and uh, wonders. Look forward to that one. Because <laughs> it's really fun. It's a huh. fun study. And it changes a lot of... Uh, there are some bad translations out there. Uh, in fact, you can look at uh, and get the wrong picture from Vines. Uh, he's, he's good, but his explanation was a little shaky as to of the difference between a sign and a miracle. A sign can be a miracle, but a sign doesn't have to be a miracle. All miracles are not signs. You know, uh, all signs are not miracles. Is that what I just said? And the other way around, all miracles are not signs. I'm sure so. Okay. Let's go to uh, the previous chapter. <laughs> chapter 8. Romans 8, just 28 through 30. Let's see, who has it read? Uh, Bob? Uh, Rome, Acts? No, Romans. Romans. Acts. 8. 828. 828 through 30. Okay. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that we might be in the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called those, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. <laughs> That's a fantastic passage. That includes so much. It, I don't even like to say it all in one word, uh, one sentence. But he says about those whom he has chosen, those whom he has elected. In 28, that, uh, it says God caused all, good, all things to work together for good, but not to everybody. So what does no called then see right you know you can't tell the law that, that terrible thing you're going through is um uh is uh God's gonna work it out for good not necessarily he says he works out for good those who love God that's the ones who he's gonna work everything out for good is for those who love God the those who are what Called, unless God calls them. 
if God called you, everything in your life will work out to the good if you're a called person. According to his purpose, okay, uh, for, and listen to what election here is those he has chosen and called, and he explains it in detail, starting there in 29, for whom he foreknew. foreknew. By the way, that foreknow, I'm not going to go into in much detail except to say foreknow isn't just knowing in advance. Foreknowing means being previously involved with. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says who he foreknew. Who he, in the past, uh, had a relationship with. Well, that relationship was his design and purpose and his choosing. And he's involved in that person's life way before they come into, into the world. And those who he foreknew, though, in other words, those whom he chose or elected, these same ones he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, right? Uh, and whom he predestined, you're starting to see the order of God's working. He uh, foreknows, and then it says in 30, he calls them. Remember, we we were amazed, and at least I was amazed at the fact that he calls them. He takes someone who's against God going that way, and he does something in them that causes them to turn around and then go that way and search for Christ. And what's making them turn around, in my opinion, is his calling. The calling is, it's like your mother yelling out the back door when you were a kid playing, time for supper. <laughs> and uh, what they did was that uh, let you know that uh, um, you had to get going that direction. Well, here, God, when he foreknows someone, then it says that he, first, what's he do? He calls them. He gets their attention. He draws, the word uses the word, God's word uses the word draw in other passages for that same thing. When he calls someone, he's drawn them. Like your mother yelling. She is yelling because she wants you to come. She's drawing you. So she's calling. She's getting your attention. Well, God gets people's attention. He calls them. And uh, whoever, whoever he does that to, he says, he then he calls them, and then the the uh, saving process uh, takes place, and it says they end up being justified. God, they're not they're still sinners, but now their sins have been paid for, and uh, God declares them righteous. not sinners anymore, but righteous. Mm -hmm. Declares them righteous. And whom uh, he did that to is going to end up in glory. He said, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. He put it in the past tense. You're so sure of heaven, he put you in the, in the future while you're still here. It's that sure. He, he, he declared you righteous eternally, forever. So... Uh, what do we say about this? <laughs> yeah, what do we say about this? Well, since God is for me, nobody can be against me. That's my uh, interpretation of verse 31. Because the if there is uh, not a question mark. The if there is, we would trans should have translated that with the word since. In other words, uh, the if is a, since this is a reality. Not, not if this is true, we know this is true. This is uh, that uh, since this is true, God is for us. Who, who could possibly be against us? All the way from Satan down to the mankind, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. So um, Romans 8, 28 through 30, election is for the called. And I would, in my mind, I put the word chosen there. Election is for those who 
God foreknew, and those he predestined. And verse 30, predestination uh, is so thorough and uh, complete that um, it guarantees we're going to be like Christ and we're going to be glorified. only want to make a very general statement here. None of these are things we do. We don't, according to this, it's God who chose us, who called us. It's God who in eternity past foreknew us, got involved with us in a real way, personally. And it's God who predestined us and the God who has guaranteed our glorification. I don't see my choice there anywhere. This is God's work. Pretty clearly uh, established. It's God's work. Now let's go to John, just back a couple chapters to six. And uh, that's why I keep getting upside down here from Romans to John. Can I Barry, John, I think you're up next. John 6. John 6, what verse? Uh, verses 45, uh, I'm sorry, 44. And then uh, we'll go to verse 65, but 644 first. No one, the, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You in John 644? Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. And I will raise him up on the last day. Okay. No one can come to me yes. unless what? The Father. He choose? He draws me. Yes. No one can come to me. That's a startling statement. No one. None of these going in that direction. No man can come to me, Jesus says here, unless what happens? The Father who sent me draws him. Remember over in the other verse? Yeah. Uh, uh, 39. Yeah. He's not going to ever lose one, so the next statement is about, bound to happen, and I will raise him up on the last on day. On the last day. So he's not anybody that Christ, that God gives Christ, Christ will never lose. Right. Important statements. Mm hmm no one is going to come to Christ. No one of that, that bunch is going to come to Christ unless God does something. Not when they want to do something. God wants to do something. Uh, now look at verse 65. Same chapter. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. No one can come to me unless. Unless what? It's unless it's granted. Granted. To him. granted. Yeah. That's all God's doing. Yeah. Could say a few more things about that, but we don't really need to. That, that's the important thing. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, back in verse 39, he said, you already mentioned it, uh, Barry. This is the will of him who sent me that all that he has given me, I won't lose any. Yeah. But raise it up on the last day. And the only ones that will come to him are the ones that God calls. The only ones that will come to him is those that uh, uh, God draws. You can see why that would go on this side of the oh yeah of the tri of the triangle there. Because mm -hmm. uh, if God doesn't draw you, you're not coming. You're not going to come on your own. Because there ain't any good ones. There ain't anyone who wants righteousness. There's any. Remember all those we read to start with. That's all that group. And, and the only ones that will come out of that group and turn to him are the ones God draws. And God has elected. God has chosen. And God has done a work that of calling them that turns them around and makes it happen. So uh, John 6 um, is a uh, a strong point for 
this side of the thing. Now let's go to Acts chapter 13. Mm -hmm. Acts 13. And um, this is an interesting, it answers the question, well, who's going to believe then? Who are the believers? And verse 13, chapter 13, verse 48, um, answers that question this way. He says, when the Gentiles got the, the message of the gospel, when the Gentiles heard this, that the gospel was coming to them, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God. They must have been hearing the word of God. And they began rejoicing uh, at that, that issue. And as now here's the here's the qualifying statement. Uh, it tells how many believe. As many as had been appointed. Here's a different word appointed. for appointed. Called. Called, mm -hmm. chosen, mm -hmm. elected. Uh, as many as had been appointed uh, to eternal life, those are the ones that believe. Mm -hmm. So uh, key, that's a key verse. Who believe? Those that God appointed. I don't know what else to say about that. So oh, can you? You're, yeah. you're not. You're not going to believe unless you've been appointed. Because mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we normally do is we take that and turn it around. We tell people it's if they believe, you know, but they're not going to believe uh, un unless God has appointed them. That kind of scrambles my mind a little bit. That's what God's word is telling us. You're sharing the gospel. You've made it as reasonable as possible. You told it in ways that any idiot could understand. And uh, if God didn't appoint them, they won't believe. Wow. Wow. <laughs> makes us pretty uh, makes us pretty subservient, doesn't it? Um uh, it doesn't, it kind of calms down my, my question of um, salvation. Someone else's salvation is my responsibility. A lot of, a lot of churches teach it. It's your responsibility. You know, save people. Mm -hmm. Knock on their doors. Get them saved. Uh, and just tell them all to get to do is believe. Well, if you explain what that means to them, unless God appointed them, they won't. They might say they believe. They And what they might mean is, I think that's true. Satan thinks it's true, too. Thinking it's true is not believing. Depending on that truth, resting in it, and uh, is believing. And the person isn't going to do that unless God has done some preliminary work in their life and, and life and call them and because he has already in the past appointed them in eternity past he appointed them they see life unfolding just like we do but they their concept of their life isn't starting early enough their context isn't big enough to uh, realize that there is a relationship between you as an individual and God that uh, he initiated in eternity past, and it's still his work of selecting, electing, choosing, and uh, calling. And unless he has appointed them, I keep saying that because it's something that we don't like to hear. It's not in our hands. Mm -hmm. it's in his hand mm -hmm. and he gives us the privilege of sharing the truth in the way with others uh, hey we're, I got five minutes here we're <laughs> next we got two to go uh, 
In 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9. Um, I'm going to do this one real quick. Go ahead and turn to it. 1 Peter 2. <clears throat> First Peter 2, uh, verses 5 through 9. <clears throat> and um, speaking here about uh, uh, Christ building the church and uh, during this age, and that those he chooses and elects are being built into a spiritual house. Uh, in other words, a spiritual dwelling. See, God doesn't dwell in buildings anymore. He did dwell in the tabernacle. He did dwell in the temple until they got so wicked that he, he left. So now God isn't taking residence in buildings of boards and bricks and stone. Now he has taken up residence in people, in individual, never happened before. God never indwelt people until after Pentecost. All through the Old Testament, God did not indwell people. He was with them. David, remember, prayed, mm -hmm. Lord, take not thy spirit from me, because the Holy Spirit did not dwell, did not live within them. Uh, they were with them and around them. God was... Uh, uh, had a relationship, but he did not indwell the believer. Now he is, and he's explaining, going through some of this here. And uh, in verse 5, uh, he said, uh, you, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. God lives in you. And now you are a holy priesthood, and you are to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through, through the Lord. And uh, it goes on down and see if verse 9, I'll end with this, because he says, you are unique as a believer in this day after Pentecost. He says, you are a chosen race. That's election. That's him distinguishing and choosing out. In fact, you're a royal priesthood. Mm -hmm. You're a holy nation. So you you don't have any sin to your account in the heavenlies. You're, you're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He lives and owns your body that you may proclaim who he is. In my Bible, it says excellency. Yep. Uh, excellency is a great word. Uh, a lot of people think of excellence, excellencies as the... Um, um, attributes of God, his virtues. Uh, and uh, that's what we may proclaim is his excellencies, who he really is, uh, that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the priesthood uh, is of the believers only. And uh, those who disbelieve uh, Amazing in verse 8, just scandalizes my brain too. In verse 8, he talks about those who don't receive him. Mm -hmm. What about them? Uh, for they, he's talking about those huh. that the, Christ is a stumbling and a rock of offense. Mm -hmm. He says, for those kind of people, they stumble. Why do they stumble? Because they are disobedient to the word, and he says, and to this they were also appointed. Some of your Bibles will have the word doom there. Did you say doom? As they were destined to do. That's good. I like that. The word doom is not better there. Than doom. Yeah. Yes. You got doom. You got doom there. It was added. It's not been salted. It yeah. actually salted. says, and, and, and to this, what the this there is the stumbling they're doing. Yeah. Or they stumble because they're disobedient to the word. And to this stumbling, they were also, what's the next word? Appointed. Here says appointed. Mine says they were destined to do this. Oh. Because they, they weren't chosen. Right. Yeah. They were destined. They were appointed. Uh, they were appointed 
to do to what? Stumble. Stumble. Because they rejected the truth. You reject the truth, you reject Christ. The, the Son of God, if you reject him, God has appointed you to stumble. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more. Revelation 17, 8. Uh, and see, I'm over. I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's only this one. And what it tells us there is that some names, talking about uh, the inscrib inscribing of names into the book of life. And it also says in verse 8 that some names have not, not been written in the book of life. When were they not written in the book of life? When the book of life is written. When the book of life, and when was that? From the beginning before, of time. Before it tells time. you there. From, when? From the foundation of the world. From the foundation, eternity past. That, that's a reality from eternity past. Those whose names were not written in the book of life. Mm -hmm. That happened in eternity past. Looking pretty solid over here. <laughs> <laughs> we got it covered. <laughs> Can't wait to see the other side. Let <laughs> bring and get out of here before we get and send the troops down there. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us to keep thinking about it and and learn from it what you want us to learn from it and be bold in the ministry of giving each one of us as believers uh, concerning Lord the um, uh, reconciliation that has been made for mankind through the person and work of your son. We uh, look forward to this week, if you tarry, uh, that we'll be profitable servants of, of the Jesus name. Amen. Perfect.